Welcome to another episode of YLG Canada Immigration Podcast, where all your immigration questions will be answered by an experienced immigration lawyer. My name is Ryan, and today we're talking about the Intracompany Transferry Work Permit, also known as ICT. Here with me is Afshin Yazdani, a barrister and solicitor from Toronto, Ontario. International Mobility Program. So, as the title suggests, I'm guessing there is some sort of workforce move involved. I, I know that I'm oversimplifying it, but what is it exactly? Uh, well, you're absolutely right. It's pretty much that. In fact, International Mobility Program is a category under Canadian interest. If a foreign worker won't come to Canada, under work permit, temporary work permit, there are some categories uh, called IMP or International Mobility Program, which uh, doesn't require LMIA labor market impact assessment for the employer. To explain, if employer in Canada want to hire a foreign worker overseas, bring it to Canada, they must apply for a labor market impact assessment. Uh, under this program, International Mobility Program, there are exemptions. The category we are discussing now is under Exemption Code C-12. Okay, okay, let me stop you there. What does that mean? The Exemption Code C-12 is under GATS. It says uh, a qualified intra-company transfer required work permit are exempted from LMIA or Labor Market Impact Assessment under um, paragraph uh, R205A, which says it can provide significant economic benefit to Canada through the transfer their expertise to Canadian business. I think all it means is that they're somehow advantaged over others. Yep. Uh, the, the point is, uh, if, if there is a program, is a work permit and doesn't need the LMIA, it somehow facilitates uh, the movement. Okay, got it. Yeah, so a standard procedure is very difficult. If you want to get the LMIA, you should have a savage company working for a while, and then there is like a requirement from CRA and, uh, and then advertisement. You need to first try uh, to get people from inside Canada, a Canadian citizen, permanent resident in Canada. And if fail, then you can bring people from overseas. Under this program, these are our exempted. All right. <laughs> Among uh, a lot of the jargons that you were throwing, there were some familiar ones like NAFTA. Um, we hear this all the time. Um, how is it related to this program? International Mobility Program is based on some uh, treaties and agreements, generally speaking. And C-12, it's under GATS, it's General Agreement on Trade in Services which is the international treaties. And the funny part is Iran, our country, I mean the home country, um, we are Canadian, but my, my own country, uh, is not part of the GATS. It's not the member. But the good thing is, under Canada immigration rule, uh, there is no, under C-12, there is no uh, country citizenship uh, restriction. So even though Iran is not part of GATS, is not a member. The Iranians can still apply. Yeah, they can apply. So it's a good thing about that part uh, because some people say, okay, we know Iran, Iran is not part of, uh, is not a member of GATS. So how the situation will be different? And then we should go back to the manual by the immigration office. And then it says uh, there is no restriction all over C-12. Other than this, we have other treaties. For example, we have free trade agreement that are with signed by Canada, uh, namely like NAFTA, or uh, NAFTA is for uh, US, Canada, and Mexico. If they want to apply, they fall under different category, which is uh, T24. They are not under the GATS. So if you have a client 
from US or from Mexico. Yeah, it's a, again, it's the international mobility program. And again, is intra-company transfer program, but it's not under GATS and not under exemption code C12. They have to apply under uh, the NAFTA. Then they would not qualify for GATS. They would have to apply through NAFTA program. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So for the interest of time, if you don't mind, let's move on to talk about requirements. I suppose as with other, all the other categories, there are certain requirements. What is required of the employee looking into this program? Yeah, it's a good point. You, somehow you become an expert yourself. The point is for work permit is based on employment relationship, right? The employment relationship, as you can guess, there are two parties. One, employee. Other side is employer. Under this program, ICT, they call intra-company transfer, you can call ICT if it's easier for you. The ICT program, there are requirements for the employee, which is the applicant for the work permit, and there are requirements for the employer. Uh, the employer who's offering the job, uh, that will be the company uh, in Canada. You are listening to YLG Podcast with Afshin Yazdani, exploring the latest news, tips, and strategies about immigration to Canada. If I want to explain what are the requirements for the employee to apply for work permit under this a general uh, provision, which means C12 exemption code, first of all, uh, you are currently employed by a multinational company and seeking entry to work in a parent or subsidiary or a branch or an affiliated of the uh, the company, that enterprise. That's the first thing. So you must be there now before moving to Canada. So it's like, I just want to clarify, I just want to use an example. If I'm working for, let's say, Hudson's Bay in Iran, then I want to be working as a manager at Hudson's Bay in Canada, that would qualify me. Am I right? Yes, exactly. If it's a branch or maybe it's a parent company, we don't have Hudson Bay in Canada, Iran, but, but anyhow, as an example, yes, that's correct. Okay. Does it always have to be some sort of relationship between these companies? Yeah, definitely, definitely. So let me back to the, uh, the qualification for the employee. So first one uh, must currently employed uh, by the company in overseas. The company which having a branch or parent or affiliated uh, office in Canada. Okay, that's the one. The second one is you are transferring to an enterprise that has qualifying relationship with the enterprise in which they are currently employed and will be undertaking employment at legitimate and continuing establishment of that company, which should be minimum of 18 to 24 months. So, that's the p second part. You are currently working, but before that, must be some continuing and legitimate relationship between you and the company you are working for, which require around one year and a half or two years of work experience with them. So that's the second requirement. And the third requirement would be the position. If you are a secretary, if you are an accountant or if a financial uh, assistant or, or case worker or whatever, you, you are not eligible under this program. You should be someone who are being transferred to a position in an executive, senior managerial or a special knowledge capacity. So it's not for everyone. It's for people who have some certain expertise. Yes, or on top of the corporation. And another thing is this employment's relationship with the parent company or the company overseas has to be continuously for three years before applying for work permit. 
So you are working for them for at least one year and a half or two years. You are working now with them. You are being employed by them continuously at least one year during past three years. That will be uh, another requirement. And then the position was, as I mentioned, uh, managerial or a special knowledge. Just keep in mind, you must come to Canada for a temporary period only. So if you say, okay, I'm coming here, I want to apply for a PR, yeah, you are fine. You, you, you will be eligible to apply for a PR after one year being in Canada under a federal skilled worker program. You can apply through express entry. But for now, you need to establish you are coming here temporary. And if they figured, if immigration officer figured your planning, your intention, real intention is to stay in Canada more than like a permanently, then you will get the refusal. Oh, so you need to establish that you're visiting or you're staying in Canada uh, for a limited amount of time and up to four years. And the intention is not to reside in Canada permanently. Yeah, it's up to four years. Yes, that at when you file the application, because I know and they know you will be eligible for a PR after being in Canada for one year. But the point is, you shouldn't uh, say anything. You're not supposed to reveal the true intention. Yeah, exactly. Your real intention. It's, it's similar to the students. For a student's visa is the same. If you apply, you coming here as a student is a temporary purpose. But you say, okay, I, I came here as a student and I became a PR. I know many people. So how was that? And say, okay, yes, that's correct. But when you apply for something, you need to meet the requirement of that thing. It doesn't matter in the future what your plan will be. I'm not saying misrepresentation to the office, immigration office. I'm saying focus on this. All right. Uh, let's move on to what we're talking about. You said there are two sides to this story. One is the employees and the other one is the employer inside company that is trying to recruit or maybe transfer an employee from overseas to inside country, right? So what are the requirements for these companies? The main thing, if you recall, you say multinational company. Multinational company means a company has assets in more than one country. So the first basic thing is, has to be a company within definition of a company. Company means corporations. Some, some colleagues sometimes, I don't know, I haven't tried this way, but my understanding, the company means in corporations. If you register a business name or a partnership in Canada, won't be eligible to my understanding. But some people say, okay, my interpretation is too uh, restricted and too limited. But I, as a lawyer, prefer to interpret things very uh, worthy other than expand it to something which I don't understand or may cause a refusal. So the company, it's first of all has to be a company. Second of all must be a multinational company, which inside the definition of it says has to have um, asset other than in one country. When I'm saying asset means office, means anything. Uh, one of the way to meet this requirement is to just establish a new company in Canada. The employer has running the company in Iran or in any other country and then want to apply, come to Canada and then establish a new business and then also send a manager or someone with a special knowledge to run and establish a new company, structure the new company, because someone who can trust. So the general requirement, first of all, company said, second of all, is has to be multinational, and the third, 
has the company in Canada must secure physical premises uh, to house the, the Canadian operation. Okay, so I just want to um, clarify by asking a question using an example. I own a private school in Iran and I have another school under the same name in United Arab Emirate and I want to establish a school in Canada and I've already rented or purchased a premise or a building where my school would be operating in Toronto. Would that qualify me? Yeah, definitely. You more than qualify <laughs> because you don't need to rent a premises or buy anything. If you are a startup, the minimum requirement, you are a multinational. The company doesn't have to be a just a commercial because the school as an example you mentioned usually is running a business it's like a kind of uh, organization definitely for profit right so it has to be for profit somehow yeah you are fine all right i mean the company is fine the company meet the requirement don't forget the employee has to meet the requirement too so that's the employer requirement we are talking now so new startup can be done, can use the, an, an address like a council, a lawyer address uh, until uh, the executive uh, or manager can purchase or lease a permit. Mm -hmm. So it's fine. The second thing is you should have a business plan. The employer must have a business plan for the new operation. The business plan, including a staffing plan. So you're going to run the business in Canada, explain how. So you should have a business plan, which I recommend draft and prepare by a consultant or, or accountant or someone, professionals, to meet the requirement. It somehow reminds me of the start of visa. Yeah, yeah, it's the same thing. The funny part is the startup visa, it's a category under entrepreneurship, which people are coming to Canada to start up something. Under this is an international startup, which means the company already, international company, want to start up a business in Canada. And uh, other than this, uh, for the corporation, also must show financial abilities. I, if you hire someone in Canada as a manager, how much salary are you going to pay? You can guess how much. Minimum 50000 Okay. Right? So the company has to pay 50000 to the employee and come to the Canada and as a worker. But one funny part. Did you know you can be employer and employee yourself? Oh, wow. <laughs> That's the funny part. Okay. Because the company, legally speaking, has a separate personality and character from its stakeholders. So if you are the owner of the company and you are offering a job to yourself, you are fine again. I have many clients in that way and which is absolutely 100% legal. Thank you folks for listening to another episode of YLG Canada Immigration Podcast with Afshin Yazdani. You can get more information on immigration to Canada from ylgpc.ca. We're trying to make this program, as I have said time and again, more interactive. So please feel free to send us your questions to podcast at ylgpc.ca. Take care. And so